I can see we're going to be a select few here today. Uh, I have been told that Dan is speaking in the other room, so I'll have to talk to him about that tonight. He's stealing my thunder, but uh, that's how it is. All right, a bit about who I am, just so you know. Uh, originally, I am a software engineer. I graduated from Aalborg University in 2003, and at that time, I graduated in, within user experience, but the industry had not yet realized what user experience designers could do, so it was hard getting a job. Luckily, I was offered a position as a researcher uh, at my university, and that went so well that they offered me a PhD scholarship as well, so I went ahead and, and took that. And then back to researching, and then I realized, okay, now I've been doing this for eight years and I've never actually put it into practice in the real world. Maybe I should see if this is actually worth something. So I went ahead and got hired at Trifork, and I've been there for nearly three and a half years now. Uh, and I'm happy to say that much more than what I could have possibly hoped for is usable in the real world, so that's fantastic. That's about me. Um, I would like to know a bit about you guys as well. Uh, such as where you're from, meaning how many of you are from a classical software company? All right, three, What's four. Uh, uh, well, a, a software company that does nothing else, and that's the main business, developing software. All right, about half. Uh, anyone that is in the IT department of a major business that does something else as their primary? One. Any designers in here? One, two, sort of. Any people in charge of the business part? Yeah, it's a couple as well. All right. So mostly developers. Um, all right. I, I think I got those two mixed up because that was the next question. What do you guys do? How many are here, here are, are purebred uh, software developers? All right. About 60, 70%. That's, that's what I expected. And now, more than just a raise of hands, what is your user experience interest? What is your interest in, in this field? Come on. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we're working very, very fast cycles, and we need user experience um, to sort of be you know, baked into that sort of very, very fast cycles we work with. OK. And that's creating problems currently, or? Yeah. Like yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. Yes? It's, it's our whole approach, and the reason why our company exists is we, we call ourselves a UX company. Okay. So we focus on building that part of the software. All right. So that's your primary profile. All right. Anyone else? No? All right. Last one before we get started. What do you guys hope to take away from this talk? <laughs> I think I can fulfill that then. <laughs> well, how to integrate it into Agile. How to, uh -huh. Without, you know, there's always a concern that Agile or any sort of process impedes, like, great design. Yeah. Or vice versa. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get a look at it. Uh, this is a case study of a project we did where we developed a, an app for a big bank in Denmark. And just so you know a bit about this bank, because I don't presume you know much about Denmark or banks in Denmark in general, it was founded in 1871 uh, under a different name back then, but, but it's still the same bank. It has 2.2 million customers, and just for you guys to or put it into perspective for you guys, in Denmark has a, a population, total population of 5.5 million. So they have quite a few, uh, they have about 40% of, of the population uh, under the wings. Uh, so it's a big bank, in Danish standards at least. Uh, in Denmark, they have about 300 departments. Um, they have 6,000 employees, and worldwide they have 20,000 employees because they don't only operate in Denmark, they operate in 15 different countries, Denmark being the primary one, which is also the reason for the name, Danske Bank meaning Danish bank. They, um, they wanted an app, uh, and they wanted an app quite early uh, before apps were something that everybody had. Um, and the funny thing was that this was not 
something that started from the high up in the bank. This was something that started on a grassroots level. It was some of the people, the, the man on the floor employees who thought this could be fun to dabble with. Uh, the problem was they, they didn't have the money for it. So they managed to raise a small pot of money uh, to start a proof of concept on this and then take it from there and see if it would work. And if it would, they would go up higher and see if they can get the money for the project. But because this was very early in, in the app story, they did not know what to expect of this. Um, this was what they wanted. They wanted to make the first and best mobile bank app in Denmark. Making the first one, that's not hard to measure. Making the best one, a bit, little bit more difficult because what is best? So they put up some success criteria uh, and in hindsight, those were modest. Bear in mind that Denmark is a small country. They wanted 10,000 downloads and they wanted five positive inquiries in any of their department. People that actually came in and said, we would like to change banks to you guys because you have a cool app. So modest goals, but given that this was early in the app history, they did not know what to expect. They have a set of core values, expertise, integrity, value creation, commitment, and availability. And what they wanted with this app was to address this one, availability. Because there are 300 departments that they have in Denmark today has gone down from about 1,000 only a few years back. So as they're closing down departments and saving money that way, they have to make themselves available to the customers some, some, somehow else. Um, and this was one of their ideas. This is a Danish slide, I'm going to translate it for you. Uh, it came out of a customer survey that they did and they realized that they have quite demanding customers because what it says is, I want to be able to go to the bank whenever it suits me 24-7. My bank has to be available no matter where I am. It has to work all the time. I want to decide how I contact my bank. I prefer personal contact. My friends are my expert panel now. I want to be able to ad adapt the product I buy to my needs. So they aren't actually shy about what they are demanding of their banks. Um, and this was some of the things that the Dan Danish bank wanted to address with this app. A bit about the case characteristics. It's a well-known topic. It's private banking. Uh, the basic banking, um, and in Denmark, out of the 5.5 million people we are in Denmark, 4 million use online banking. So that's quite high. That's total. That's not only in Danske Bank, that's total. Um, so it's a very well-known topic, and th even though if you look at the online banking across banks, it's very similar, the way it functions. It's, it's minor details that differ between them. We also looked at what they already had. They had existing services at Danske Bank. Uh, they had online banking that they had had since 2000. So that had been in existence for nearly 10 years when we started this project. project. And then they had mobile banking, meaning they had a website of their online banking uh, service. They had that as a, a mobile banking uh, service that had been started in 2003 and that never really caught on. So it didn't have that many users. But we, of course, looked into what they already had to find out what we wanted to make. That also meant that the functionality was well-defined. They had to be able to view their accounts. They had to be able to view their transactions in each account. They had to be able to transfer money from one account to another, in bank, between own accounts to other people, to other banks, and so on. And they had to be able to pay bills. These four were the four primary functionalities that this app had to cover. And then they also wanted a way to contact the bank via this app. That makes sense, it's a phone, so of course you would want to do something like that. And because of the mobility of, the, uh, of an app and a mobile phone, they wanted a currency calculator in there as well. So these six functionalities were what they were aiming at. But there were some challenges because everybody who is in user experience and has been doing that for a while have been reading the books about how such a project should go. But the real world never matches a textbook. And in this case, that was the same thing. We had some challenges that we needed to look into. 
User needs, are they the same regardless of platform? We knew what the user needs were on a website or on the online banking system, but we didn't know if it, was, it would be the same on a mobile app. How do we actually use the hardware of the platform when the functionality is this fixed? Then you have to think out of the box to actually make use of all this fancy hardware. How do we avoid that the designers delayed the developers in this process? How do we test this when it's under an NDA? And NDA, people know that term? Yeah, good. Um, because that was the case with this project. How, how do we test it with users then? How do we test when we can't test anything live? And finally, we had a fixed release date. And when I say fixed release date, everybody has a fixed release date. Everything has an, a deadline. This was a little bit more fixed than usual, and I'll get back to why. So these were some of the challenges that we were facing in this project. We were using Scrum as our agile method. Uh, and I presume most people know Scrum, correct? Yeah? Anyone doesn't? No. Okay, I won't go into detail then. Um, some of the things that we looked into were how are we going to estimate the size and the scale of this project? Because this was the first app we were ever making as a software company. So we had no idea what pitfalls there were and, and how, we could, how badly we could get away with this in estimation-wise. Estimation so we had to look into some way of making this estimation more secure. Uh, and what we did was the proof of concept, where we took what we estimated was 10% of the total app, made that, found out how long that took, how much money that cost, and then we had a better idea of how much would the total project take. Uh, another thing we did was that on the product backlog, we included UX. The reason for this is that when the customer is, is uh, prioritizing on the backlog, it should be visible to them that UX is not something that just comes for free. UX takes time, UX costs money. So if you prioritize UX on whatever functionality it might be, then you might actually have to put something else further down the list. So that worked quite well. Um, we worked in sprints, of course, two-week sprints, and what we did was make the UX one week ahead, or one sprint ahead, and I'll get back to that with a, a more detailed timeline later. We also had, we also made sure that we had a product owner in the bank that prioritized UX. This was not that hard to find because, as you remember, one of the goals was to make the first and best app, and the best part is usually covered with the UX. So they prioritize UX, and that's very, very important because if you all know it, if you don't have a product owner that prioritizes UX, that's usually the first thing to get cut when you're in, in time trouble. All right, and finally, testing. When do we test the UX, and how do we test it as, as we go along? Um, and of course, th this is... Uh, this is one of my favorite drawings because it really does tell what the advantages of doing Agile is. That you can be a lot of people on a project and you all think that you're thinking about this project the same way. But it isn't until you start talking together you realize that we're not thinking about this the same way at all. And especially if you have developers and, and UXers and graphical designers and product owners and you know various different profiles. And it isn't until you actually start talking together that then you modify everybody's way of thinking about the project. It isn't the same still, but it's a lot closer to being the same than it was over here. And in a project like this where, where time was an issue and money was an issue, it was very, very important that we didn't go out on a tangent and never came back. We had to make sure that everybody was on the same page all the time. A bit about the time planning. And this is not the full project, I couldn't fit that on a slide, it's just to illustrate to you how we worked in parallel. Because that I see a lot when people are working in, uh, in, working in scrum teams, that it becomes agile, sort of like a waterfall model anyway, where they have loops where they, or sprints where they are doing design, and then they have sprints where they're doing graphics, and then they have sprints where they're doing developments, and a few sprints where they're testing. And then you might as well do a waterfall model anyways. 
This is not the case here. We actually did work in parallel. Of course, I had to start off making interaction design because until I have drawn a minimum of sketches of what we're making, nobody will be able to code anything. The problem is you always have some developers who are eager to get started. And for them to not start making something that then is completely in, uh, in uh, at edge with what I'm drawing, we start them doing other stuff, you know, getting a hole through to the bank and making sure they can fetch the right data and doing back end and all that sort of thing that does not require them to do front end development just yet. But then the, more, the most trigger happy developers can be put on this duty instead um, until I have something to show them. Once I have started and I am a bit into my design, then the iPhone team starts. The reason that I'm not done yet is because I start out by making the overall structure, saying, okay, this is how we should, in broad uh, strides, navigate this app. I haven't decided it on every little detail and every little button and every, in every functionality, but I've made the overall structure, and then I've designed one functionality all the way through the uh, to the bottom. Because that's the one functionality that I can then hand over and let them start developing. And while they develop that, I'm drawing the next functionality, making wireframes for that. At some point, I'm done with my wireframes, and they are usually not done developing just yet. That doesn't mean that I let go of the project. Because then after that, and that's, that's the beauty of the, uh, the agile process, that's what it's supposedly good at handling, is change. The world changes, we become more and more uh, we knowledgeable as, as a project progresses. And for that to actually have an impact into the project, it won't unless I'm ready to actually clarify and correct and expand on the usability as we go along based on what we've learned so far. So what I started out making is not necessarily what was made completely in the end, because some things were expanded, some things were changed, uh, minor changes, uh, things were clarified because I had misunderstood something in the domain or whatever. So I, I keep following the project after I have delivered the initial interaction design. Two weeks after the iPhone team starts, then the Android team starts. Why do, I not, why do they not run in complete parallel? Anyone know? You're nodding? First of all, you have the experience from the first design with the iPhone. Second of all, from the core technology standpoint, you can test it with the iPhone to start with Android. You're exactly right, and that was the reason we did it, that if they had been running in complete parallel, then they would be making the same mistakes, both, both teams, at the same time. Instead, because the iPhone started, then they could pass on whatever they had learned to the Android team and then prevent them from making the same mistakes. Also, it turns out that that works quite well in the end because once interaction design is done, the first development of, on the iPhone front end is done and the, the uh, back end is done, we can start testing the iPhone. And we test that in all three parameters. That means we do white box and black box and unity test and all that sort of stuff there. And we test the back end as well, of course. And then we test the UX. So this, what I made here, is that actually what has then been implemented? Or are there little details that were lost in translation somewhere? And the reason that this is smart is because those of you who make apps know that there is this thing at the end where you have 14 days where you send something into Apple and then you hope you get a, a thumbs up back, basically. You don't know what they're doing, you don't know how they do it, you don't really know anything. You just send it off and then you hope you get a, a thumbs up back. And average, it takes 14 days. Sometimes it takes longer. If some, one of the times I have known that it to take longer is if they have just come out with a new iOS that looks radically different. When iOS 7 came out, everybody was doing iOS 7 graphic updates, meaning that the wait time there was a lot longer for a period of time because they were really busy uh, going through all of these apps that came in. And the good thing about this is that while the iPhone app is lying there with Apple waiting to be approved, then we can do the same with Android and test the Android, white box, black box, all those technical tests, and of course test the UX. And it's not because these are that different. The functionality is the same, 
the look and feel of it should be the same, but there are certain ways of navigating that are different between the two platforms. And the worst thing I know is to see an iPhone, uh, an iPhone app on an Android platform. Because people who choose an Android phone, they choose so actively because they don't want an iPhone often. So if you have chosen an Android because you didn't want an iPhone, then you don't want iPhone apps on your phone. So you have to be sure that you keep the standards of the two platforms. And that's what I'm checking for, and that's why I'm checking both of them vigorously. All right, so as you can see here, and, and basically this part is the one that's much longer than what would fit on the slide. So in far most of the project, we actually do work in parallel, all of us, without anybody hindering anybody else. And I could actually add another arrow on there called graphics because graphics needs to be developed along the way as well. And that runs in parallel more, parallel more or less with this one all the way from the start. Um, so we can have five different profiles all working in parallel most of the project, except for a few weeks in the beginning. All right, as I said, we did a proof of concept um, to one, to actually make sure that we could estimate this more correctly. And two, because this was something that started from the bottom of Danish Bank and they did not have the money for the full app, but they wanted this tested and they got the money to do a proof of concept at first. So what we did was three basic workflows. We did the log on because we knew that there would be something about security issues and, and, and that sort of thing that we had to handle and, and that could pose problems. We did account overview, the reason being that we knew that this app was gonna contain a lot of lists lists of transactions, lists of accounts, and lists of currencies, lists of whatever. So we had to make sure how, how long does it take to make one of these. And finally, the currency calculator, because that in look and feel was very different from the two others. So that way we could actually have a decent way of doing an estimation of the entire project afterwards. These are not screenshots of these exact three things, but these are some of the screenshots of the early uh, proof of concept. Uh, where the menu is a wheel uh, with a lot of pies, uh, one of the login screens, and one of the transfer money screens, the initial transfer money screens that we were dabbling with. The scope of this was two and a half months, and it was, t yes? Out of curiosity, the code from your active card, I mean, did you actually carry the cards with them? Is that something that people mostly had at home? No, they actually carry them with them. Um, we agree on that, but that's a whole different story because that's, that's on the highest level in the government decided that it has to be these things that you use for blah, blah, blah. It's, it's not something that we could beat in this project. We want it to, but it was not something we could beat. I'll get back to more on that later because there's a whole different story there. But you're right. You are definitely right. So it was time boxed uh, because we didn't want this to run off into oblivion. So it was time boxed and it had to dis include design, which was unusual because usually proof of concepts don't include design. Not UX nor graphical design. This included all of it because, as I said, they prioritized UX and they prioritized the, the look and feel of the app as being just as important as the functionality. All right. Uh, we had some use patterns um, because they had existing services that they did extensive um, extensive statistics on and, and collected all data behind the scenes there. Uh, and we could use quite a lot of that. They have 1.2 uh, million customers on online banking um, out of the 2.2 that they had back then. Uh, those 1.2 million customers do 7.5 million logons per month. So they're actually quite active. It, this is a very used service. Uh, and they had all sorts of user statistics from this. So where, uh, how often do they log on? When they log on, how, off, uh, how long are they on for? Which pages are they on for how long? Which features do they use the most? Uh, where, uh, from what page to what page do they usually navigate? All that sort of thing we could dive into and use as much of it as we could in the app. Uh, so that was one way of, of getting to know enough information. The thing was, this was under an NDA. We could not go out and ask the user. And that's what, we, that's what the textbook says we should do, but we couldn't. 
So we had to somehow get the information elsewhere. This was one of the ways, but it's not the only one. We had them make a survey. They hired an external company and made a, an anonymous survey. So the people answering did not know this came from Danske Bank. And they were asked if they would use a mobile bank, if they had one. 70% said they would. And then they were, of course, asked, what would you use it for, mostly? 51% wanted to see the balance of their account. 40% wanted to transfer money, 32 wanted to pay bills, and 31 to see transactions. This was, of course, guessed by potential users, because we all know that what they think they will be using it for is not necessarily what they end up using it for or how they end up using it. But at least it gave us an indication that there's an interest here. People can see themselves using this. Yeah? This was, pr this was before. The, the, there wasn't much out there when this came out. Uh, we, of course, also asked them, uh, what would be the biggest hindrance for you to not use it? And not surprisingly, it was security. And you can say that that's not really logic, because the, why would a, an, a mobile phone be any less secure than a PC? But for some reason, to users, that it, it's perceived that way. And that's what we were battling with, that you have security and then you have perceived security. And you can have very high actual security. If people don't perceive it that way, they won't use it. So you have to have both. Or if you are a crook, you only go with perceived security. But we're not crooks, so we wanted both. We wanted them to feel that this is a very secure system. So we went for two-factor login. And in Denmark, that's via your social security number, and then a service code that you get from the bank, which is a four-digit PIN code. And finally, this NIMED, it's called, Danish paper-based security solution. It looks like this, and people carry it around. And yes, I know it's ancient, but that's how it is. That's how it is. And the worst part is it doesn't even actually run the NIMED because that's a, a Java uplet, so that can't run in the app. So we are only piggybacking on the piece of paper, not the actual software solution. Um, and that's been a tug of war for, I don't know, five, six years by now, that the banks won't use this system that, they ha that the government has proposed because it is not fit for this purpose. So there's a battle going on there. We're trying to stay out of it and then go ahead with what we do. So that's, that's what we started with. That changed later on, and I'll get back to, you, to that later. The design process. I started out by sketching. Something like this. It's not pretty. It takes three minutes to make. And it tells you what you need to know, basically. So there's a top bar here with a headline. There's a back button. There's a locate me. There's a map here with some pins on it. That pin is open. It says address, and then there's more. Uh, access to more information here, and there's a, a bar at the bottom where you can switch between list view and card uh, or map view, and a couple of other options down there. It's not pretty, but if you show that to your client, they can very easily look at it and nod and say, yes, it's something along those lines we want. I don't want any more time invested in something like this than highly necessary until I've had them nod. Because any time invested in it, if they don't not, is wasted. So there's no point. But of course, at some point, you want to make it a bit neater. One of the reasons being that I don't write in a continuous font size 12. So it's hard for me to judge where you can actually fit into a picture if it's only hand, hand drawn. Then you move it to the computer and say, OK, if I actually put it in computer and make it a bit nicer, can I fit everything there? And as you can see, I ended up removing these two options down here and instead making the button fill the, the, uh, the entire bar. And then instead, make another bar up here where you can switch between three different views on the map. So things happen from this one to that one, not in, in, in uh, functionality. It's the same functionality, but in the arrangement of things in the screen. And after that, comes graphics. 
The reason it doesn't come until then is because if you go back a while, why was UX something that, why was this a discipline that started happening? It was a discipline that started happening because there were too many software projects where you ended up developing something that the user didn't want, which meant it became very expensive to changing it into what the user did want. That could be prevented by having it only on paper until the customer had nodded and said, yeah, that's what we're making. Everybody has been doing these long, long, long specification documents that then you haggle over afterwards because did this line mean this or that, depending on who you ask. It's the same with graphic designers. It also is very expensive to have them redo graphics if they don't need to. So there's no point in having them make graphics until you've actually done this step and had the client nod and saying, yeah, it's something like this we want. Then they start making graphics and make it look nice. So this is still just a wireframe. There's no, there's no 3D effects, there's no rounded corners, and there's no colors, there's nothing on there except just wireframes. And these, of course, can also be put into, oh, that was not even on there. Um, yeah, of course, design versions. It was not, like I said, I clarified it and corrected it and, and expanded it as we went along. And that meant that some of the things changed many times during the development phase. One of them, uh, one of the things that changed the most was the login, uh, partly because of this whole discussion with the, the, with the, the card, the paper card. So here you have social security number. It was split into two fields, then you had the active card, and then you had log on, and it says become a customer down here. That's how it started out looking. Then that was changed because the bank insisted that you should not only be able to log on with your social security number, you should also be able to log on with your customer number, which is a random generated number that you have in your bank. They insisted on that, so we introduced this one. Um, and then you either filled in your social security number or if you had chosen this one, you filled in your customer number. Still personal code and then log on. Active card had disappeared because that was the time when we weren't sure if to do active card or NEM ID or a third solution. So it changed again. And it changed again because we found out that this customer number, nobody could remember that because it was a random generated one. So Nobody ever used it. The bank still didn't want to get rid of it, so what we did do was say user ID up here instead. So not social security number, not customer number, just user ID. And then they could enter either. And then the back end would recognize whether it was one or the other. And now we have the service code of four, uh, of four digits, and it says next on here, because then what came next was the paper ID. But, as I said, um, there's security and then there's perceived security. We wanted them to perceive this as being highly secure. But security is often at edge with comfort. People are lazy. They can't be bothered with a long login process. So this had been out, this version here had been out for three months or something like that, and then we started getting complaints that it, was, it took too long to log in. Uh, so what we did instead was change it to this one. Still the user ID and your service code, but now it says log on instead of next. The reason being that now you did not have to use that paper card to log in initially. Because viewing an economy does not damage it. So that, ha that can be less secure than if you're actually affecting the economy. That means if you're transferring money or paying bills, you would still have to use this paper card. But it was delayed until when you actually use these, uh, these functionalities rather than just logging in to see your economy. And that, the reason for this was that, you remember the survey and saying what people would use it for? The use pattern today is much different. People log in at least once a day to see the balance on their account. That's all they log in for. Second most used one is actually the transactions. That was the lowest on the list before. But the reason that people log in to, to see their transactions is because they want to see, has my salary gone in? Or has the money somebody owed me gone in? That sort of thing. And it's not until third and fourth place in use that you find paying bill and transferring money. 
So that's why we wanted to delay the hassle of the login process to that late. All right, using the platform. We wanted to make sure that once we, go, once we go on this new platform that offers a lot of hardware that can be used in different ways, that we actually make use of it, because otherwise there's no point. Um, the more obvious one is, of course, the currency. There's a currency calculator in their online banking today, but it's not being used very much, and it's, it's hidden much further down into the system. The reason being that when do you need a currency calculator? When you're on holiday. When you are on holiday, you're not in front of your computer at home and you're not on the internet. So people didn't need it in their online bank because that was not the use scenario where they needed it. But now they do need it a lot more because now it's on their mobile and they actually have that with them. So they have it where they need it. That's why that was made a much more prominent feature in the app than it is in the online bank. This one is a little more unusual. This is a typical Danish bill. That's how they all look. Have the same structure with the amount here, the date here, the amount over here, because this is the receipt slip that you get over here. Something about who is being paid by and to and that sort of thing. And down here you have this long, long, long code that you have to type in correctly. And people never get it right because it starts by two digits and then you have 16 digits and then you have another eight digits. And they are what appears to be randomly generated. So chances of getting that right in the first go are really not that good, especially not on a mobile phone. Um, so we found out that because these all look the same and they are all using the same font, you could use picture recognition uh, software on these numbers. So you can go in and you get like a, like a normal picture taking screen, but there's only this where you actually take a picture. And then you focus that on that line of numbers and it fills it straight into the app and then you can pay your bill. You only need to put in the amount and the date. So that was an unusual way of making use of the camera, which is usually for taking pictures, but in this case used for, for picture recognition instead. And that was hugely popular with, with the users when that came out. And then, of course, using the GPS to locate nearest branches and, and uh, nearest uh, ATMs and that sort of thing is also a classical way of using the hardware in the platform. So despite the functionality being very fixed and very familiar, it is actually possible to use some of the hardware that's at your, at your disposal. We had testing challenges because this was under an NDA. Uh, the reason for this was that the bank wanted to keep this secret for their competition. Um, they knew that some of their competitors were doing something similar. They didn't know how far along they were, and they didn't want them to know that they were doing the same thing. What was weird was that we were doing both apps, both teams were in the same software house, and we were not allowed to t talk to each other. So we, we, Often you have projects being on an NDA, but you can usually discuss this with your colleagues. We couldn't. People didn't even know who we worked for in this team. We were just the blue team. <laughs> not, not usually we are, we are named by the customer we are working for. We were just the blue team, and then people had to guess. Uh, meaning we couldn't talk about it over lunch in case, of, in case the green team was sitting there as well. And, you know, it was ridiculous. But that's how it was. They really, really were fierce on this comp competition of being there first with this app. Also, Danske Bank uh, is a very old and stoic bank, and they have this rumor of being very conservative, old-fashioned, and that sort of thing. I think a lot of banks do. And they wanted the element of surprise. They wanted to come out and saying, aha, you might think we're old and conservative and whatnot, but we can actually be hip with the young people because we've been doing something like this as well. You didn't expect that, did you? So they wanted that. And also, they wanted the control of the release. They wanted to be sure that this didn't fizzle out and was blown up in the media before they could actually you know, present the, the result themselves. Um, the control of the release was also the reason that we had a deadline that was a lot more firm than deadlines usually are. Because in this project, the amount of money spent on the app, I think they spent 
somewhere between 50 and 70 times as much on advertising for it. And that came out on that date. There were posters everywhere on every bus shed in every city in Denmark. It was on TV commercials, it was in full page uh, ads in the newspapers, uh, big banners on all uh, main stations in Denmark and so on and so forth. And that was rolled out on the 15th of September. Imagine if the app was not in the app store by then. That would be bad. Because when, when you start a, a PR marketing machine like that, you can't stop it right away. That takes a while. So we had to have it in the App Store and ready to download on that date. Otherwise, it would be a huge problem. The other problem we had with testing was that we had no live data. Of course, we couldn't test on live data. That would jeopardize uh, customers' finances and ultimately jeopardize the bank's uh, rumor and reputation and economy as well. So we couldn't test on live data. So what did we do instead? Well, we of course did continuous tests every sprint, and that means technical tests as well as UX tests and, and any kind of test we could run internally. But on top of that, we had the bank employ 50 testers that were supposed to test this every sprint. And you have a lot of clients doing this. They say, okay, well, we'll test this internally. And then you find out that, okay, yeah, they have spotted a few people and say, you, you can test this when you have time, but they never have time. These 50 testers were actually assigned this job and time every week to do so. So they had a certain time every week where they were supposed to test this. And that was huge because that gave us a lot to work with. So they had dedicated test time where they weren't supposed to do anything else. As we came along with the app, we started making test cases, saying, OK, these test cases you should go through every week to make sure that we didn't break something since last week. And as it went further along, we started automating some of them because there was a lot of them at the end. So we started automating as much of, of these tests as we could. And finally, because I couldn't do usability tests with actual users, so I had to do expert evaluations instead going through it with heuristics next to it and, and see what guidelines are being broken and where, uh, and then suggest fixes based on that. Is this as good as if you can involve the customers? Of course not. Is it better than not doing anything at all and just give up? Oh, yes, it is. You can get quite far with something like this. We didn't have live data to test on, but the bank had a test environment. The problem with the test environment was that it was dummy data. Uh, and as it always is with dummy data, they're usually not very uh, accurate or very realistic. And there usually isn't enough of it either. The good thing about it was that we could test this everywhere, because that was always, that login uh, or that environment was always available to us. Uh, and it was only us who could log in. But for instance, if I did a transfer between two accounts, yeah, I could see that I could go through all of the screens, but then when I went back to those accounts, nothing had changed. That was some of the problems that we were running into with the test environment. But they also had something called a system environment. The system environment was real data. So it's not completely true when I said we couldn't have real data. or We couldn't have live data, but we could have real data. What they did was take an enormous amount of customers and all of their data and then jumble that up and mix it and match it and, and, and you know, completely anonymize it. So nobody could be recognized and none of it was you know, the way it has, actually looks in the real world. But it made it realistic and made sure that we had a lot more data to test on. The problem with this was we could only use this at the bank in the beginning, meaning that every time we had to test anything in the system environment, we had to go to the bank's premises. That was a hassle, because you all know it as developers that you code something, then you compile it, then you run it and you say, oh, no, it does not work, and then you redo, blah, blah, blah. And to have and go back and forth every time you had to do something like that was a real hassle. After one and a half years, we finally managed to get um, a connection, a secure connection to the bank, so now we could actually also test from the offices, which helped a huge deal. And then finally, of course, there's the production environment. That's live data, and you can test that from everywhere. The problem is everyone can test it. So then it's a race against time, see who finds the er any errors that come that far. 
before us. And chances are the customers will. They, are, uh, they outnumber us by far. All right. We also made sure that the feedback we got, that we collected that meticulously, because since we couldn't test with users, everything we could get from the internal testers was important. So we had a system where they had to uh, report in what the problem was, which platform it happened on, which version of the app it happened in, or which, which version of, of the iOS it was running. Who should take care of it? And that one was important because you, that's what uh, prevents it from falling between two chairs. Of course, as many details as they could, can they recreate it? What were they doing when it happened? So on and so forth. And attachment, mainly screenshots of whatever it was that happens, but other things as well could be relevant. And, and that worked really well because that way we, we were sure that we made the most of any kind of feedback that we got in this process. The timeline with the bank, because this happened in 2010, the proof of concept, but a lot has happened since then. Proof of concept was in May 2010, actual app came out in September. Uh, December, then we started being able to pay bills with camera. Then in 2011, they expanded it with an entire investment uh, functionality where people could look at their portfolios and trade and that sort of thing. Then it came to iPad and investment for iPad as well. Then a new visual design, because now the uh, visual design guide had changed, so they made a new visual design for it. Then we did Windows Phone 7. Then we did spending overview, where you could see where have you actually spent your money the past month, how much on groceries, how much on utilities, how much on mortgage, and so on and so forth. So people have an, an idea of where is my economy going. Then they started making corporate apps, various types of, of business apps. And then in, later on, we came out with mobile pay, which is a way of doing small payments back and forth through your mobile phone, only having people's phone number. Um, and finally, mobile pay business. So this has been a, this started out with a small idea that some people in the bank had with a small portion of money. And look where we are four years later, how much we made for them. I think if I count every app we made for them, I think we are way past 20 apps. And it was only the first time it was under an NDA. This was the banner on the main square of the capital of Denmark when they came out with their iPad app. I think it's about 40 times 50 meters big. So they were not shy about it afterwards. They definitely wanted to, to make more of it. This is mobile pay and how that looks. Very, very easy way of transferring money between people without having people's account numbers and that sort of thing that you usually don't have. You usually only have their phone number. It works across banks, so you don't have to be a Danish bank customer, which is very smart. And finally, 5.5 million people in Denmark, 1.5 million have downloaded this app. I would say that's a huge success for any app to have that kind of, of push through in any, in any country. They've done a lot of social and media and crowdsourcing, so they did an idea bank uh, for their smartphone on Facebook after the initial one came out. They got 263 ideas with 3,000 votes. And these are some of the ideas. And the huge thing about this was the fact that these were then implemented. And their customers loved that, that they actually were able to have an impact on this app and where it should go, what should happen next. That made them connect more with their, with their clients. So they did the same thing for iPad when that came out. A little few ideas, but more votes. And finally, the best idea was rewarded with a cake. And that's not a big deal. But the fun thing is that these are not stock photos. These are the actual developers that originally came up with this idea in the bank that are on that cake. And I think that's cool that they get the credit. All right, so how did it go? This is uh, just some of the things. This is transfers between own accounts, transfers within the bank, transfers to other banks, and payments. And as you can see, it's just going up, 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 all of the users. Success criteria, 10,000 downloads, five positive inquiries. That was the original. The actual, 750,000 downloads and more than 3,000 new customers. So yeah, I would say it's a success. 3.6 million login per month, and the big one is that in September last year, 
they actually ended up having more users on their app than they have on the web. So they crossed that line. Remember I mentioned a mobile website? That is the mobile website. That's the launch of the app. It's a big difference because this could do the same thing. But the difference between these two were UX. And this is just some of the press that it's been getting. Danske Bank is beating Nordea, which is the, the biggest competitor, in a new mobile bank test. The Danish people love the iPhone bank. Danish bank gets new customers via mobile bank. Danish bank is having huge success with camera payments. And then on mobile pay, mobile pay is expanding the head start on the competitors. Mobile pay is beating the, the out of others, is <laughs> basically what it says. Uh, and here it says it's, it is blowing SWIP off the track. SWIP is, is the nearest competitor in this thing. And also to test, they win that as well. But, and that's more important, this one, because one of the things is the press, but the ratings. And that's on this one, that one is on Android, that one is on iPhone. Very good ratings all along. And not only in the Danish one, across all countries. So Danish one, Swedish one, Norwegian one, Finnish one, Irish and English. All doing good in their respective countries. So this is an example of how well it can actually go even though you have anything but a textbook development process with all sorts of complications and hindrances along the way. It can go well if you think out of the box of how to solve these problems. That's what I had. Questions? Yeah? Uh, you, you mentioned uh, you have two versions, one for the Android, one for the Apple. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, we did a Windows Phone 7 as well, but Windows Phone 7 is not particularly much used in Denmark. I think about 3% have a Windows Phone 7. So we only did basic, basic banking on that. We haven't done investment on it, although I think that's coming out just about now. How big is your team on uh, combined these three platforms? Uh, on these, I think by now we're about 20 to 25 people working on it, but that's doing four projects or something like that. The original team that did the iPhone and Android basic banking app was seven or eight people. And that was done in, in the, what was that, from May to September, something like that, so four months. And that includes two others, designers? That, and that includes everything. Includes everything. Huh? Infrastructure too, but that was the good thing. The bank had the infrastructure. Yeah, so the back end was, we only had to do a middleware uh, development to actually uh, piggyback uh, on the back end they had, because they had that from the online bank. Otherwise, it would have taken longer, you're right. All right, other questions? Can I ask one more? Yeah. Well, the same way we've always done with them, uh, except now we once in a while we do user testing now because now it's not on an NDA anymore; it's out there. So now we can do user testing at least it's on some of it. But other than that, we still have the 50 internal testers at the bank, and we still test everything: the developers and and the UX and the graphic designers. All of us test yeah, it continuously. I'm That's basically, or that's, that's mainly based on, on test cases, standardized test cases that we go through every time, and as many of those are automated as we can. And also, that actually was one of the reasons that we created a spin-off company called Less Painful, which is because they wanted less painful testing. <laughs> that's the name, Less Painful. Um, and what they do is they have... I. I'm not completely into it, but what they've done is they've written a test procedure where you can, you can hook in as many phones as you want and then write a test scenario that you have to press this button, then you have to wait this long, and then you have to press here or swipe there or whatever. And it will go through that movement on all of these phones. And every time it's done one of these uh, commands, it will take a screenshot. And the report you get out of that is a line of screenshots across 
But what is really good about that is because you can scan across and say, okay, is there any of those that look broken compared to the others? And also, if at some point it crashes, then, okay, now that one is no longer providing screenshots, but the rest are. Then you know there's a problem with that specific platform there. Because it's with the amount of Androids and also by now the amount of different iPhones, testing on all of them and testing all functionality on all of them is a monumental task. So that's why they came out up with this system, and that works quite well, actually. All right. How have users' expectations changed over the years from the first mobile app? They become increasingly demanding because as they see more and more apps out there, and they they move more and more of their digital world onto the mobile phone rather than the computer, and because they can compare across to other apps and see how well they do, they become increasingly demanding because they, they won't accept that we fall behind because they say, well, others can do that, why can't you? So they are very demanding and they keep us on our toes, definitely. All right, thank you very much. Yes, we constantly run two weeks sprint. Yeah, we have other projects where we run, where most of them we run two week sprint. We have a few that we have been running one week sprints, but that's a bit short. So mostly it's two week sprints. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right.